My name is Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. This fireside chat is titled Encryption Ideology, a conversation with CEOs. Mallory Nodal, Chief Technical Technology Officer, rather, Center for Democracy and Technology, will be facilitating this chat. Uh, she is the CDT's Chief Technology Officer and is a member of the Internet Architecture Board and the co-chair of the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group of the Internet Research Task Force. Mallory is also on the advisory committee for the Open Technology Fund. Enjoy the discussion. Welcome to um, Costa Rica Day 2, Costa Rica RightsCon Day 2. Um, when we were getting this panel together uh, several months ago, I was obviously faced with a challenge that you are all competitors with one another. Um, and uh, there was some reticence, I think, on behalf of the participants in the panel to come together and talk about this issue on one stage. But then something happened, and the... UK government and other governments around the world really um, have started pushing some, some terrible policy and you all came together on your own actually to write um, a letter uh, against that policy. So after that point, you were all working together anyway. So it made this panel possible and I just want to thank you for that and for being here today. Um, we are going to get into the, uh, the nuances of uh, the current debate against encryption right now. Uh, but first, I want to ask you to give us some scene setting. So this is um, obviously at the top of a lot of people's minds, but not everybody in the audience or participating remotely might know um, about the current debate. So we want to acclimate everybody. Um, and then we'll get into it deeper uh, later on. So there's going to be a report out next week um, by the Digital Forensic Research Lab. Um, they talk about the difference between various apps, the consequences for misinformation and various things online. Um, one of the interesting facts in it um, is that almost 70% of people in the United States are using messaging apps, which is a really huge number. Um, and I want to ask you to introduce yourselves by way of talking about the differences between your apps, and specifically, though, if you could answer why your users use your messaging app, what they're looking for, and if you want to make it extra challenging, try to explain that without talking or using the word privacy explicitly. Um, I think we should start in person. Meredith, let's start with you, and then we'll go online and end with Will. Well, I think our users really value um, Ivacy Prey. <laughs> um, you know, look, I don't want to speak on behalf of the many, many millions of people who turn to Signal and use it for reasons that span from, you know, they may have an existential, you know, stakes in terms of their communication and the power asymmetries between, you know, those who may surveil or use their data in ways that could affect their lives and, you know, what they want, you know, that they may actually have very high stakes. And mm -hmm. they turn to Signal because they would like to communicate openly, intimately, and without the dangers of that type of mass corporate government surveillance, which has become the norm mm -hmm. in terms of our digital communications over the last 20, 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's pretty simple. Um, mm -hmm. And we, you know, we've provided that service for, you know, we can date it you know, a number of ways, but the Signal protocol was released in 2013. Mm -hmm. Signal came out at that time, and we are lucky to have developed a network of effective users that means Signal is actually useful mm -hmm. to the people who pick it up, not a hypothesis project that needs to employ them in a kind of multi-level marketing scheme mm -hmm. where they have to, you know, ask all their friends to mm -hmm. also use it. So yeah. um, I think that's, you know, that is my assumption on why people turn to Signal, but again, I think there are many, many reasons from you know liking stories to you know being a journalist to being in an at-risk area and organizing and, and requiring pri privacy to be able to do what Excellent. you need to do. Um, Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> I'm not currently associated with a particular messaging app, but I've been working um, on the technological foundation for other messaging apps. 
Uh, for the past five years, I've been working on messaging layer security, which is an end-to-end -end encrypted protocol. Um, and what motivated me was all the feedback I have received for the past 10 years. Um, I also don't want to speak on behalf of other users, but um, yeah, I've always um, received this feedback, and there's also clear evidence that end-to-end -end encryption protects people. And, and at the end of the day, that, that is what motivates me. Are we going to be able to hear you. them? We can't hear Will. Or we, we can't hear Matthew, I'm sorry. And are you coming through now? Should be Hello? able to hear me? Yeah, better. Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Sorry about that. No. Um, so I was going to explain that, um, I guess, uh, at Matrix, we come from a slightly different angle in that Matrix is a secure communication protocol that people can use to go and build their own communication apps, which they can go and run on their own terms. And we actually came at this more from the viewpoint of freedom than the P word um, in terms of giving people the autonomy, the self-sovereignty to run their own communication infrastructure. A bit like you can run your own email server or you can run your own web server on the web. We found that it was a bit of a shame that the web doesn't have a common language, an easy way for people to communicate securely themselves. Um, I guess instant messaging and VoIP is hard. It came quite late to the picture. It didn't become part of the commons of the internet. And so we're trying to fix that with Matrix, and that's why we've created it as a system. And then Element is the app which we use as a flagship for Matrix to go and get it in the hands of people. And I guess um, they use it for similar reasons, as they might use Signal or other secure messengers with the twist that they may want to run it themselves in their own country, on their own terms, in their own jurisdiction. And then I'll go, I'll go. Hey everyone, it's Will. Um, I work on WhatsApp. Really glad we're having this conversation. Thank you for doing it. Um, I think it's hard to answer without using the word privacy, but I'll try. I mean, I loved Meredith's point that it is very hard to generalize. A lot of people use WhatsApp just as with all of these services, and they use it for different reasons. Why someone in the US might want to use it might be different than a journalist, which might be different than someone in Iran. Um, but I think the, the common need is you're trying to have a, the equivalent of a face-to-face -face conversation with someone when you can't physically be next to them. Um, and I think with that comes the expectation that you want that conversation to be as, I'll say, secure um, as it would be if you were next to someone. When you talk to someone in person, you don't want someone else to be listening to the conversation. You don't want a record to be kept of it. Um, you know, we, we find that people really care about the conversation being secure. Um, they really like our service because it's reliable um, and they want it to be easy to use. They want the software to get out of their way so they can just have the conversation and not have to figure out something complicated. And that's particularly true all around the world. When, you know, we have a lot of users who are new to technology or new to the internet. And so them having something they can just figure out how to use quickly that then delivers the security and reliability they need is, is um, part of the benefit. Right. So I'm going to ask some specific questions to each of you. I want to start first actually with Meredith and Will. I want you to catch us up on the current version of the crypto wars, right? We actually, they started in the Cold War and then digitization happened and that was the sort of thing in the PC era. Um, mobile phone era, we started talking about something like the clipper chip, solutionism, um, and now we're in the smartphone era um, and the crypto war has changed and we want to know what's different this time. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, if you could talk about what's happening in the US, what's happening in the UK, uh, and then we'll turn to Matthew and Raphael after that to round out this conversation about how it's looking in, in other parts. So what's your take on the crypto wars, whatever point oh we are? Yeah. Um I mean, look, I think the thing that hasn't changed and is very unlikely to change is the will of those in power to benefit from the kinds of deep information asymmetries that mass, surveillance via, be, mass surveillance via digital technologies and access to corporate surveillance can give them, mm -hmm. right? I don't think that fight is going away because I think that, you know, if you look back through history, the will to surveil, the will to use surveillance and information asymmetries for social control is extremely old. It, of course, predates digital technologies. Digital technologies, just, you know, the way that they were commercialized in the 90s, the fact that we handed, you know, corporations a 
ticket to self-regulate on privacy means that they are now a smorgasbord of unprecedented surveillance. And that is the norm that we are, you know, us and others who are building privacy preserving communication apps are, you know, fighting against, right? But it's a very new norm and it is not, you know, there's no long history of this surveillance. So what is the new, you know, the new crypto wars? Um, this is what I saw and I, you know, I've been in the AI space, I've been kind of around issues of kind of, you know, social control and technology for the past 20 years. Um, but I think around 2018, what you saw was a collapsing of kind of content moderation debates and, you know, debates around privacy and encryption and free expression. Um, because it is very clear that if you have a platform that is a, you know, media broadcaster, you are going to have to do some form of content moderation so it's not the ultimate pit of garbage that, you know, unmoderated internet spaces tend to turn into for many reasons I, you know, I'm not going to go into, mm -hmm. right? But that sort of bled over, I think, very opportunistically and in a pretty, you know, bad faith strategy mm -hmm. into conversations about encryption and about the right to private communication in a way that allowed, you know, this sort of resurgence of, you know, the will to backdoor, the will to surveil private communications. Around 2018 is where I saw it, but, you know, those of you who are, you know, you may correct me on that. And I think what we're seeing now is some you know, kind of combination of the type of magical thinking that the AI hype has given, you know, a lot of steroids to, like client-side scanning will use AI to do mass surveillance in a way that's actually privacy invasive, mm -hmm. you know, not privacy invasive, sorry, um, and a kind of, you know, building on the hype and the fact that so many companies and so many individuals are out there grifting, making claims that technology can do things it can't, you know, under the banner of AI, which has allowed this extraordinary bad faith narrative to inoculate both the UK bill, which is this, you know, kind of client side scanning is at the heart of that, and the chat controls bill in Europe. And so I think part of what we have to do is one, just stand our ground on this. It, you know, mass surveillance is not commensurate with privacy. I don't care if you're, you know, threading the needle on some tricky wordsmithing by saying, you know, mass surveillance happens before you encrypt. So don't worry, you can encrypt permissible expression once we have surveilled it and determined it after that. I um, mean, we also have to be, you know, much more vigilant about pushing back on this AI hype which is painting these technologies as super capable and inflating their, um, inflating their ca capacities in ways that are, you know, they're great for venture capitalists and they're great for AI startups and they're great for the three companies that are controlling AI, but they are having, you know, really profoundly harmful effects on discourses like this that I don't think we're recognizing as clearly. So that, that's my spiel on that. Um, Will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really echo the point on magical thinking. I think the entire history of the crypto debate and the encryption debate, there has been um, this element of, of not wanting to acknowledge the reality of the choice, not wanting to acknowledge that you can either have encryption um, or you can see what people are doing. Um, you can read their messages, you can listen to their calls. Um, but I think the thing that's changed, um, which is both good but also hard, is we've moved from overtly saying encryption is bad and we don't want it to people saying they support encryption, but then proposing something that would take it away and just not being willing to say that it would take it away, right? You go back 20 years, it was encryption shouldn't be legal. You shouldn't be able to export it out of the US. Everyone has to install a clipper chip so we can see what they're doing to um, now most people are saying they're pro-encryption while they're trying to take it away. Yes, there's some examples. I mean, in the US, there's some legislation like the Earn It Act that's a little more hostile, or Attorney General Bill Barr was very open in just saying he didn't think there should be an uh, end to encryption. But in the UK, in Europe, people are standing up and saying, we're pro-encryption. But we would like to, as Meredith said, scan everything you've said, surveil everything you've said before you encrypt, which is not really encryption. If you're surveilling everything everyone has said, you don't believe in encryption. Um, similarly, around the world, there's places like India or Brazil where there's concepts being discussed of traceability. Um, where they say we're pro-encryption, but we want to be able to figure out who said something first. Um, and so I think that's good news in that it means it's a recognition of the fact that people want encryption, people want privacy. It is harder to stand up and say you want to take that away now. Um, but the hard thing is it makes the debate much more complicated to follow. And there's a risk people fall into this trap of magical thinking, of thinking there's some sort of magical technological solution. Oh, good. My stuff's all encrypted when in fact it's not. And I think, as Meredith said, we have to push back very hard about that and we have to educate people about what the proposals really are asking for. 
which is the ability to read everything everyone writes and to hear everything everyone says. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Matthew and Raphael, uh, we'll go in that order. I want you to fill in the gaps a little bit on some of the specific proposals that you've seen or also just actions taken, because some of it is proposed legislation. There have been sort of more targeted actions taken by other countries, even outside the US, the UK, EU. I'm, talk I'm thinking of India, Brazil. But yeah, what's your take on it? I can definitely speak to the UK angle, because as you can probably hear from my accent, I'm based in London, and so I'm right in the firing line of the online safety bill legislation that is currently going through government in the UK. And in fact, it's one of the final stages called the committee stage of the House of Lords. And so I think the seventh out of eight phases that legislation goes through before it actually gets turned into law. So the chances are high that the online safety bill will go into law in some incarnation. And the question is simply uh, whether it is going to fundamentally undermine encryption um, or not. And I think that Will has nailed it by pointing out the um, well, uh, this almost nightmarish situation where um, they, it's, people are saying that they're not removing encryption. Instead, they um, are doing client-side scanning, and they're not touching the encryption at all. And it seems to be working incredibly, terrifyingly well. So I've spoken to all of the lawmakers in the UK now working on this to try to brief them and say, hey, I'm responsible for one of the main UK-based encrypted communication companies, and what you're saying is wrong. You cannot have both encryption as well as scanning because that will undermine the encryption. It makes no sense. And the response I get is for people to say, but I've been briefed otherwise. Yeah. And I, what, what do you do with that? I mean, it's... Uh, it's not a rational argument. If you have a politician who may not be particularly technical, who has a bunch of policymakers who have all convinced themselves this is true, presumably because there are a bunch of content scanning companies who are selling them snake oil, claiming that the technology exists today and that you could depend upon this to the level that you put people in jail over it, and then they believe it, Though obviously it makes people running encrypted communication companies sound as if they're just trying to wriggle out of regulation by pushing back on it. So, I mean, from an impartial perspective, it's an incredible um, move that they've done, but it is terrifying in terms of the impact on human rights um, as a whole. Uh, I really like the analogy that um, secure communication should be as secure as talking to somebody in person. And if you think about the amount of time that people spend chatting to people over with each other on WhatsApp or Signal or whatever it might be, um, it probably outweighs the number of in-person conversations that they have. It certainly will outweigh the number of people that they probably speak to in person on a daily basis, unless they're incredibly social. And um, any government who suggested that you put a CCTV camera in every private conversation in order to use an AI algorithm to scan for bad content of some kind and then report back to, I don't know, the guys who built your house, perhaps, if you seem to be doing something wrong and they then have to report that to the authorities. Would, I, I can't think of any country, the most authoritarian dictatorship in the world, I don't think would try to go and, <laughs> with a straight face, tell that everybody has to put the government approved CCTV camera in their bedrooms in case they do something illegal. Whereas that is literally what is being not ironically proposed by the UK with a straight face off the back of this logical fallacy that somehow it's possible to do that and maintain privacy. And I found it bewildering. So that is, um, <laughs> that's the situation that we're up against, I'm afraid. Okay. Yeah, I agree with all these uh, statements, of course. Um, I think the important takeaway here is that uh, we are not in a new debate. We are in a new facet, sorry, of an old debate, which um, means that we need to recall what, what has happened. So you already mentioned the 90s. Um, historically, encryption and cryptography was in the military domain. That means the government was used to having a monopoly on it, like it had a monopoly on munitions or other things. That went away in the 2000s because it was not practical. So in the US, these um, export controls were relaxed. I grew up in France, for example, and uh, cryptography was heavily regulated back then. You couldn't have keys that are too big 
Uh, there was a key escrow uh, scheme, if I remember correctly. That went away as well because it was not practical uh, for the internet anymore. Um, and then if you fast forward to the 2010s, um, all of a sudden it became more of a societal debate, which it wasn't before. Before it was more niche, it was more about national security, etc. Um, and all of a sudden we see deployment of you know, end-to-end -end encryption at scale, thanks to you. And so that, that made it a societal issue fundamentally, and, and the debate changed in the sense that uh, first it was about terrorism. Um, th that was a threat model that was painted at the time. Um, these days, uh, it's about child abuse. And that's a, it's a very emotional thing, of course, and it make, makes it very difficult um, to have that debate because nobody wants to be associated with that. It, it's very hard to speak publicly. Um, nobody wants to be seen uh, to be an enabler of, of any sort of crime, of course. And so this, this makes it particularly hard for messaging operators and technologists um, yeah, to, to find the, the right wording around that, talking about concepts um, that are quite dangerous. Yeah. But we do have to find a way to actually discuss that issue head on. We cannot approach such an emotionally charged and serious issue as the abuse of children and say, well, it's math, right? There's an incredible you know, mismatch between what we have to say and the power of what we have to say and the kind of callousness that is gonna come through if we don't actually acknowledge the seriousness of that issue. Um, and then you know, do some research on, is there any evidence that mass surveillance has helped reduce child abuse. Absolutely. There is no evidence, right? Like we actually have to fight back on those terms, which is hard. It's, you know, it's kind of uh, very uncomfortable. It is like emotionally difficult, but I don't, you know, I don't think we have a chance of pushing back effectively if we don't also take them on their own ground. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, we, we are forced to deal with that. Um, yeah. I and I want to actually move into that. It was a question I had posed to Will because of this magical thinking narrative. You've touched on it already where um, encryption is, is seen to be the problem. It's covering up crimes. It's allowing people to talk about things or share things that they wouldn't be able to do in the open. So it's both the problem and because it's not banned, it is also must be the solution to. It is somehow both now. Um, and this magic, this is the definition of magical thinking, right? This is the, um, everyone has now been convinced, as Matthew was saying, that these are compatible. And it's just because they've been told so, and they want to believe so. But so Will, I wonder if you have insight then into how um, companies with civil society, with all the stakeholder groups really trying to protect users can push back against this pervasive like epidemic of magical thinking in the encryption space? Well, I think, I think there's a couple things we can do. I mean, one, going and having all the conversations and all the briefings and lining up all the people who really understand the space to talk about it. So that if you're making this decision as a policymaker, you're not just hearing um, from the one or two people who briefed you on one side, you're actually seeing what the bulk of technical experts, the bulk of civil society thinks. I think that's really powerful, actually. Um, I think the other thing, and Matthew talked about this a bit, is help get people out of the technology and into the areas they can understand, like their living room and a CCTV camera. Help people think about this is a conversation between two people. What do you want to, how do you, do you want a company to keep a record of it or not? Because I think people have much stronger intuitions about the right balance um, between uh, tools for law enforcement to fight crime and fundamentally reshaping society through mass surveillance when you get away from the phone and you get to something they've understood for more than 10 or 20 years. And then the last thing, I do think we need to play up um, the consequences of taking encryption away that are really concrete, right? It's not just an abstract loss to people's right to privacy. It is what will happen to journalists and their sources. What will happen to governments using these tools to communicate? A lot of governments use WhatsApp or Signal or other secure online tools to communicate themselves. Do you really want other governments watching your cabinet meetings, um, listening to what your soldiers say to each other, um, reading what all of your um, companies are saying in their private business? You can kind of go down the list. And I think making these things really concrete help frame up the debate because you're now pointing to the thing they are proposing to take away. Um, and being really clear that it would go away if you took away encryption. Yeah. You would no longer have secure communication. And 
So to build on something that's also related to this problem of magical thinking, you've already mentioned AI. I want you to talk more about AI, Meredith, because I think it's it's also within your wheelhouse and you've said some really interesting things in the past on it. But I so I wonder the framing of this question though, if maybe there are people like us who really do value our privacy and, and want maybe to protect that from the onslaught of AI, that every product we interact with online is taking our data. And so what is the role of end-to-end -end encryption in helping folks feel like they're not constantly participating in the training of large language models yep. and things like that? How do we opt out of that surveillance capitalism with E2E? Um, I'll try to condense this because there's actually there's a lot here and there's a kind of long history that leads into sort of making some claims that are kind of fundamental to answering this question. So you know, I hope this, I hope I can give you a little potted version. Um, but you know, AI requires huge amounts of data. AI requires huge amounts of compute. My sort of, you know, my analysis is on this is like AI as a term is more of a marketing term than anything else. In the 2010s, you saw the consolidation of the tech monopolies. What did they have? Oh, they had a ton of data because they got to self-regulate on privacy and sort of develop a surveillance advertising business model through the 90s and 2010s. Oh, and they had a ton of compute because that's what you need to sort of serve the types of markets that they had and to, you know, collect and process that data. So those ingredients were already there. You know, AI is then, you know, what I would call a surveillance derivative. It makes use of, you know, makes more use of that you know, those resources and allows these companies, again, to make claims to having magical or sentient or, you know, even capable solutions across a number of markets they weren't naturally already, you know, kind of serving. Um, you know, education, healthcare, there's AI for X and we could go through X for like two days because that list is just, you know, innumerable. So AI requires this amount of data, right? It is a way that, you know, I believe we're seeing the kind of entrenching and justification of a surveillance business model that is, you know, ultimately anathema to the kind of privacy that you know, we're, we're working to offer people in the communication space. And I think there is a, there's a way that is, you know, just very direct and literal that end-to-end -end encrypting you know, communications um, is keeping that out of the pipeline of AI surveillance, right? You're not feeding a large language model. Um, I don't think we can claim that this is sort of the solution, right? If we do, if we end to encrypt everything, AI is going away, right? Because there's a lot, you know, there's a lot more there. And we aren't, most of the data that is collected about us or made up about us isn't something that we are really consenting to, right? We walk down the streets, we're profiled by a bunch of CCTV cameras, right? We sign up for a job, there's a, you know, they scrape the web for any mention, they do some like really, you know, pseudo-scientific competency score that feeds into whether we get hired or what have you. So these, these systems far outnumber and operate in domains where, you know, consent around data or end-to-end -end encryption would just not work. But I think, you know, if we set up that frame, we recognize like AI is, relies on surveillance, AI relies on a consolidation of, you know, tech company power, and AI is also sort of perpetuating more surveillance. So the way that it is applied is, you know, if you are judging what type of person I am via a facial recognition AI system that, you know, reads my face and sort of correlates that with like a good worker or, you know, an honest person or what have you, you're also producing extremely surveillant and extremely invasive data about me that doesn't have to be correct to actually have a huge impact on my life. So I think we need to recognize these as surveillance technologies that feed on surveillance. And finally, that are also, you know, I think a huge culprit in the acceptance, the guileless acceptance of this kind of magical thinking, right? Like not to, you know, like when Mark Zuckerberg goes up in front of Congress and says, we have an AI system that can catch 95% of hate speech, that is feeding into the exact type of magical thinking that, you know, a couple years later, we're now dealing with the UK government saying, like, we have a system that can mass surveil without breaking encryption, right? We're saying the same, you know, the suspend disbelief, don't worry, there's magic behind the curtain, I think is something that across the board we have to be pushing back on. And that means also the statements from these corporations about AI being, you you know, intelligent or super capable, um, you know, is at the core of this sort of under undermining of privacy and the undermining of a like a factually grounded conversation about the limits of technological systems. And and yes, just to underscore that the fundamental incompatibility with data driven methods and end, -end encryption, where the yep. content is just not yep. there. Yeah. Um, 
Raphael, I want to ask you about um, privacy, right? Um, you know, I think the privacy is the new frontier, I think is the tagline actually of your work, right? And um, while we have uh, tools like intent encryption to protect the content of data, there's also a task that's rather non-trivial to really minimize or eliminate as much as possible metadata. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily normalized yet within even the intent encrypted apps that are uh, ubiquitous and used. What are the what are the privacy benefits of end-to-end -end encryption beyond just confidentiality? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great tagline. Privacy is a new frontier. Um, so <clears throat> we have made some progress in the past 10 years regarding end-to-end -end encryption. So it's not ubiquitous yet, um, but it has been deployed at scale. Not everywhere, but in, in larger messengers. Um, so that's good. Um, but beyond encrypting the content, there is, as you say, metadata. And metadata is like anything that is not content, essentially. When you send a message to whom, how frequently, etc. And uh, all of that can be very sensitive. Not necessarily always, just like content is sometimes also not sensitive, but it can be, and it's hard to determine when it is and when it's not. And we produce a lot of metadata all the time, when messaging, also in different contexts. And I think it's crucial in a, in a very connected world um, to protect metadata as well. And this is where um, research is still happening. Um, Signal has been spearheading that with, um, thank you for doing that, <laughs> with minimizing the amount of metadata that is available on servers. Um, but Signal is quite unique in that sense. It's, yeah. it's not the norm yet at all. Um, I think it should be going forward. Um, this is something that uh, we are working at at Phoenix R&D, reducing metadata um, in the context of messaging, also in the context of federated and, and decentralized um, messaging. So I, I, I personally wish to see more of that, um, more research happening with practical solutions that can be deployed, um, because it will be increasingly more important going forward as we produce more and more of that data, as it becomes easier to store it, um, to mine it, to feed it into large language models, etc. And I imagine the more different kinds of apps we have, the different options users will have for usernames, use of phone numbers, use of email addresses when they sign up. That's also some like critical metadata that folks who care about private messaging also sometimes do. And that's where I turn to Matthew because uh, Matrix and Element, you're, you're, it's a new paradigm. You can run your own server. You can proliferate. Uh, messaging apps based on your own configurations to some degree. Um, and this speaks to while we have billions of people now using end-to-end -end encryption, thanks to the Signal protocol, thanks to WhatsApp, we also um, don't have it everywhere. It isn't ubiquitous. There are loads of, of services that uh, users have asked to become more encrypted. Um, I wonder if you can just catch us up also to the efforts that you've been a part of, Raphael's been a part of, I've witnessed in um, the standard space to create a new protocol um, that will be open and that will help make encryption more ubiquitous. Yes, I mean, the business of going and creating new protocols is uh, obviously a challenging one in that you have to get it right and hopefully have something that lasts for as long as the internet protocol or HTTP or email or one of these other kind of building blocks of the web. And um, that's what we've done with Matrix already over the last eight years. And interestingly, the team who built Matrix started off building centralized, unencrypted, commercial proprietary messaging apps. So it's literally the same bunch of people who spent a few years doing that, selling them to um, telcos, and then we decided to create Matrix and did it all again, but this time as an encrypted open protocol. And so we can say firsthand that it's at least 10 times um, harder to go and try to build something as an open ecosystem. Now, I think that the initiative that you're referring to is um, a working group within the IATF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, called MIMI, which stands for More Instant Messaging and Interoperability, that has been um, founded by various different actors interested in the space, including Raphael and the MLS um, team, looking to standardize a common interoperable protocol that can be used um, between the big tech companies, particularly who the EU is regulating as being gatekeepers under the Digital Markets Act. 
And the EU has basically required um, that for competitive reasons, the big players have to be able to interoperate so that their users have the ability to pick the service that they prefer rather than being locked in the service um, where their other contacts happen to be. So it's a really interesting problem where you go and take these existing large organizations and figure out how to link them together whilst preserving end-to-end -end encryption. And this is um, an instance of regulation being pro-encryption, thankfully, in that the EU explicitly put it into the Digital Markets Act that the privacy and security of the users must not be compromised when interoperating between, say, I don't know, WhatsApp and iMessage or whatever the services might happen to be. And that's a hard technical problem to solve, to say the least. And so that's what Mimi um, is focusing on. And as Matrix, we're participating quite heavily in that, hoping that um, the work that we've already done can feed into the bigger open standards process, which has many different um, parties involved. But for context, Matrix has got about 110 million users on the public network in total. So not quite as big as the WhatsApps of this world. Um, but more interestingly, they're spread over around 100,000 different servers. And those instances are all sorts of different sizes. For instance, Ukraine runs matrix servers as a decentralized way to, submit, to securely communicate in their own territory and to be resilient to the obvious infrastructure problems that they're having at the moment. And then there may be individuals running it on a Raspberry Pi in their bedroom or people running it on a virtual server on Amazon or whatever it might happen to be. So this is what I meant at the beginning about having the freedom to empower people to run their own infrastructure. Now, one final thing that we're looking at is um, a hybrid peer-to-peer -peer approach where obviously many users can't run their servers. They're not technical. They don't know how to get a server. And you don't want everybody to end up back on a big shared server because then it centralizes again. So what we've done is to build Matrix so that you can also run it entirely on your phone. You don't even need internet access. It operates over Bluetooth Low Energy, operates over AWDL, which is the thing that AirDrop uses, so that um, you have true autonomy, that the user has complete control over their comms without being dependent on a server. And so you solve the metadata problem because there aren't any servers to gather metadata in the first place, other than kind of relays which behave a little bit like signal servers. So that's the sort of um, state of the art that we're playing with there. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to collaborate with other people in the industry on Mimi. And we hope that uh, Matrix will end up um, informing how Mimi links together the big guys. And in the green room, I was chatting with Will to see whether WhatsApp might be interested in getting involved. And I guess we need to watch this space. Thanks a lot. I have, I, I will admit, I have so many questions unasked of you all because there is just so much to talk about. So we need to move to wrapping up though. Um, I'm gonna ask you to play a little rapid fire game with me, if you wouldn't mind. I'm gonna ask you, um, it's, I'm calling it Some Critics Say. So these are common things we're hearing in the press. These are common arguments that we hear all the time. And I wanna see if you could respond with your absolute best, most crisp, <laughs> response like in under in under 30 <laughs> seconds yeah and i'm gonna i have a different one for each of you so okay so my first one's to Raphael. some critics say some critics say end-to-end -end encryption is dangerous because it's not possible for a platform to both offer encryption and keep users safe at the same time 30 seconds yeah i think that's a great example where different notions are being conflated um so i think the opposite is true um, safety and security comes because of end-to-end -end encryption and, and not the other way around. Um, and I think it's, it's absolutely possible to have safety with end-to-end -end encryption. Other mechanisms that also provide safety are not incompatible with end-to-end -end encryption. Um, you, can do, you can build a, a lot around it um, to keep uh, users safe. Um, you can do a lot on the UX level. Um, so, yeah, I think um, this is just misinformed uh, as a statement. All right. Next one's to Meredith. So, some critics say end-to-end -end encryption is a technology that, intentionally, that is intentionally designed to protect criminal behavior from being accountable to the rule of law. Citations, please. I mean, I, like what? Yeah, they do. <laughs> and it's not true. I mean, I think... Like my my response to that is I don't I don't agree with it. 
I think if we look at the history of human communications, the ubiquity of centralized surveillance has never been more uh, pervasive. Um, you know, up until a hand, you know, a few decades ago, the default was privacy for human communications. Privacy is a fundamental human right. It has been recognized as such, you know, repeatedly. Um, I don't, you know, I would ask if, if some critic said that, I would probably spend about two hours looking into that critic's background. Who is paying that person? Um, you know, what other things have they said? And what are the interests behind a statement like that that is so flatly false and so clearly interested? You know, if we're not going to be serious, you know, we don't have to be serious, but if we're going to be serious, we have to talk about privacy as a human right, and we have to talk about mass corporate and mass government surveillance and the fact that we have no evidence from history that mass surveillance has ever led to safety, has ever protected anyone. And I think we really need to ask the question, safe from what? Because you look at Europe, you have Hungary is criminalizing LGBTQ resources and identities. You look at Uganda, the death penalty for being gay, something that was informed by the same U.S. evangelicals that are pushing for bans on being trans, that are pushing for you know, a shutdown on free expression, on book banning, and all, on all sorts of other things that have pushed for Dobbs, right? And you know, this is going to come right. home really, really quickly mm. if we don't get serious about this conversation. So that's what I would say to that critic. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Will listens to you. Some critics say end-to-end -end encryption is a way for companies to get out of the responsibility to moderate user behavior on their platforms. I, so I, I think end-to-end -end encryption is um, a responsibility companies have to not keep a copy of everyone's data. The, the, the end responsibility I think a company has or any organization offering communication service is do everything they can to keep people safe. And I think it would be irresponsible for me to keep a copy of everyone's messages on WhatsApp. That does not mean we're not committed to doing work to above encryption to keep people safe. We make it possible for users to report. We ban hundreds of thousands of accounts every month based on a lot of sophisticated work we do behind the scenes. So I think the way we address that is we talk about all the work we're doing to keep people safe, starting with adding end-to-end -end encryption, because I don't want to have everyone's personal information sitting on a server available to be hacked or lost. You ask people what their top fear online is, it is the loss of control of their personal information to hackers, um, and encryption addresses that. All right, thanks. Matthew, this one's to you. I'm sure you hear this a lot in uh, the UK right now, but some critics say end-to-end -end encryption isn't that important to everyday people, and most people would be very willing to give up access to strong encryption if it meant kids can be safer online. Wow, it almost feels like a plant question because we just um, went and charted some um, research from an independent um, body who went and polled a couple of thousand um, representative UK citizens and we asked them that question. And we'll publish this, I think, next week. But the answer is that 83% of random UK citizens want to have end to end encryption to protect their private conversations. So it doesn't get much more crisp and con you know, concrete than that. Interestingly, they also said only 65% of people wanted it at work, which, you know, make of that what you will, but it shows that as individuals, people are more interested in about protecting their personal data, their naked selfies, whatever it might happen to be, than worrying about their employer's data. But uh, I, I was frankly reassured that if you just grab people on the street, they do now understand you know, the as Will says, that people really don't want to have their data smeared all over the internet and people stealing it and cannibalizing it and exploiting it, and that encryption is key to that. So thanks to WhatsApp for their bus shelter adverts to educate everybody. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you all again. Um, we really do have to wrap up, but I wondered if we could, I could just ask you all the same question. You can briefly respond. Um, I think one of the messages we wanted to send with this panel is that there's a lot of alignment in uh, among providers of end-to-end -end encryption apps d despite the many different vectors of attack against it in all corners of the world. And so what sort of commitment are you making to protecting encryption going forward? Just reassuring us that we're kind of all on the same team, we're all working on this, and, and how can you characterize your particular effort in that? Start with I mean, we would saying. shut down before we would adulterate or undermine the privacy promises that encryption is the technological guarantee for. So I don't think it's any clearer than that. We don't 
we don't have a reason to exist if not to provide a truly private mechanism for communication. So that, that's where we stand. Thank you. Yeah, I've been, I've been working in that space um, for the past 10 years, and I, I want to continue doing that. There is no reason uh, why we should compromise on any of that. So we'll keep on working on end-to-end -end encryption, on privacy-preserving uh, technology, uh, me personally, and, and Phoenix R&D. Great. Matthew, why don't you go ahead? I guess on the element side, we can commit that we will never undermine end-to-end -end encryption by implementing any form of client-side surveillance. And even if element ends up blocked from, say, the UK app stores as a result, we can t commit to continue to grow Matrix as an open, secure, decentralized network so the users can run their own servers anyway and pick their own clients and have full autonomy over their own communication. So even if element goes down, Matrix cannot be killed, just like you can't kill the web or the internet. And so we prevail in that respect. And Will? We're going to keep offering WhatsApp as a secure service. Um, we would rather be blocked than take away people's privacy. Um, and like Signal, like Matrix, um, that's happened all around the world. We've been blocked briefly in Brazil. We're blocked in Iran. What are we going to do? We're going to keep making the service secure. And we're going to do what we can to keep it available to people um, so they can access it even in regimes that have chosen to block it. Great. Thank you all so much. And OK, just really one last question, though. I have to know, when you all um, communicate together, how do you decide where to use the group chat? Where does the what? Well, we use Signal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you guys. <laughs>